As nuns, we must all patiently endure the inevitable hardships of our simple existence without becoming lazy or disgruntled. Let love and compassion be your ready response to every situation. Ideal Buddhist Nun Mechi Gao returned to join a healthy spiritual environment of the Banhui Sai Nunnery. During her absence, the local Buddhist laity had come to view the monastic community there as a vital part of village society. The villagers understood the Buddhist teaching on generosity and virtue as an invitation to the wider community to support the religious life of ordained renunciants. The presence of practicing nuns within rural Putai society was a stronghold of goodness, a genuine field of merit that all people could cultivate for their own benefit. The Banhui Sai nunnery beckoned women seeking spiritual liberation and nurtured the spiritual lifestyle of the ideal Buddhist nun. She was a woman who stepped out from ordinary society, renouncing a household life of husband, children, and family to take a vow of complete sexual abstinence. Her appearance reflected her changed status. Her head was shaved, and she wore white monastic robes. Adopting a wholly religious path, she abandoned the normal means of livelihood and instead depended on the generosity of others to supplement the few possessions she owned. The basic spirit of a nun's practice was found in the solemn rectitude of the moral precepts, the training rules that guide the life of the Buddhist renunciant and her path to spiritual liberation. Because the precepts are the bedrock on which all spiritual progress rests, ordained followers of the Buddha's teaching have always attached great importance to their observance. The moral training's true worth lies in its power to cut through the karmic causes and conditions that bind living beings to the cycle of birth and death. The precepts provide a foundation for Buddhist practice that closes the door to actions carrying painful karmic consequences. At the same time, it upholds the purity of mind and deeds that lead to freedom from suffering. The moral precepts also ensure high standards of purity within the monastic community, enabling it to flourish internally and to function as an inspiring model for lay society. In the Banhui Sai nunnery, a nun's conduct adhered strictly to eight basic precepts. In practice, she never harmed living creatures, she never took what had not been given, she led an entirely celibate life, she never used false, divisive, harsh, or frivolous speech, she never took intoxicants, she never ate food after midday, she never amused herself with entertainment or adorned herself with jewelry and cosmetics, and she never rested on high or luxurious beds. In essence, these simple rules articulate a way of life characterized by restraint and renunciation, leading to detachment and insight. The first four training rules, strictures against killing, stealing, lying, and sexual activity, delineate the moral foundation in which Buddhist monastic life is rooted. The other precepts are principles of spiritual training that help to create the conditions for a calm body and a clear mind. As such, they are merely an expansion of the basic four. When a nun is pure in observing the spirit of the first four, the other precepts are easy to keep. On the other hand, their infraction is considered a major offense. Seeking to solve the problem of suffering in any way that harms other living creatures is a misguided manifestation of anger and delusion. Taking what is not freely given betrays the fundamental relationship of trust existing between nuns who undertake lives of ascetic practice and those who, in good faith, offer them material support. Failure to maintain vows of celibacy undermines a defining characteristic of Buddhist nuns, their renunciation of ordinary family life. Beyond that, sexual abstinence helps to channel their energies toward higher spiritual attainments. False or frivolous speech undermines truthfulness and destroys trust within the spiritual community, among the lay supporters, and most of all, within one's own mind. The nature of true moral virtue is subtle and complex, so complex that it cannot be attained merely by reference to precepts and rules of conduct. Ultimately, moral virtue is not measured in terms of adherence to external rules, but as an expression of the mind's pure intentions. The basic goal of the Buddhist path is to eliminate from the mind all impure intentions. Thus, true virtue can only be achieved by following a path of training that succeeds in rooting out greed, anger, and delusion. Moral precepts are a necessary part of the training, but the practice of moral virtue cannot fully accomplish its goal unless it is oriented toward the practice of meditation. Properly nourished with virtuous intentions, the mind quickly and easily develops meditative calm and clarity. Therefore, a nun who abides by the precepts experiences an unblemished and spacious happiness within. Life at the Banhui Sai nunnery was quiet and simple, emphasizing the development of mindfulness in each daily activity. 
Through her meditation skills, Mei Chi Gao began to assume an expanded leadership role in advising junior nuns on the mode and direction of their mental training. She strove to lead by example, setting the tone for the others by rising at three in the morning and walking in meditation until five. With the sun's first early morning rays illuminating the pathway to the outdoor kitchen, she joined the other nuns to prepare the day's food. The fragrant aroma of food and incense mingled softly in the morning air. A generous portion of their cooking was set aside to be offered as alms to monks from a nearby monastery. After respectfully placing the food into the monks' bowls, the nuns quietly gathered at the main sala and ate their morning meal together in complete silence. They reflected on the nature of the food set before them, Viewing it as no more than a necessary requisite supporting their religious lifestyle, they developed an attitude of contentment with whatever they received. Following the meal, the nuns washed their utensils and cleaned up the kitchen area, before retiring to their separate huts to continue their meditation practice. Because they ate only once, they were free to focus exclusively on their inner development for the remainder of the day. Having completed the morning's chores, Mechi Gao turned her undivided attention to meditation. Retiring to a small cabin in a secluded section of the nunnery, where gigantic clumps of bamboo mingled with teak and mahogany trees, she entered a calm, quiet environment free of external distractions. Under the leafy canopy, on a shady space of level ground, the local villagers had made a walking meditation track by clearing a broad swath of earth and smoothing it out flat. After sweeping the path clean, Mechi Gao stood erect and alert at one end and joined her hands just below the waist the palm of the right hand gently overlapping and clasping the back of the left. With eyes downcast and mind focused, she paced back and forth, from one end of the path to the other, pivoting and turning in one fluid and easy motion at the end of each span. She found the continuous movement of walking helpful in relieving the drowsiness and mental torpor induced by a full stomach. Harmonizing the repetition of foot-toe foot with each footfall, she completed several hours of continuous walking every morning. As her mind became absorbed in Butto and her concentration deepened, the rhythm and pace of movement began to change, adapting fluidly to the steady current of awareness that had developed. Moving in perfect unison as a single entity, her whole body appeared to glide effortlessly along the path, as though on a soft cushion of air. Refreshed and invigorated, Mechi Gao then sat under the shade of a spreading pyom tree at the side of the path to continue her meditation until 3 p.m., when the nuns took up their afternoon chores. Together they swept the grounds of the nunnery, filled the water jars with water from the newly dug well, and then went off into the nearby woods to collect mushrooms, bamboo shoots, and other edible plants for the kitchen. After an early evening bath, Mechi Gao joined the other nuns at the main sala for the evening chanting. When the chanting was finished, each nun returned to her small hut to continue walking and sitting meditation in the peace and solitude of the surrounding forest. Mechi Gao walked in meditation again for several hours before retiring to her hut to sit until late at night. In the first few months after her return from Ajan Gongma, Mechi Gao continued her diligent focus on body contemplation. But gradually her attention drifted away from the body as a meditation subject and toward her previous habits of external focus. Body contemplation went against the grain of her inherent spiritual tendencies and in the end, she succumbed to the natural momentum of her dynamic and venturesome mind. As soon as she closed her eyes, she felt herself falling down a precipice. A window to the universe opened up, and suddenly, she was off on another adventure.